Porter, I'm the president of the TriMet Board, uh, and I'm going to call this meeting to order. Uh, we have a couple folks uh, that uh, will be here, board members will be here shortly. Actually, uh, uh, Steve Clark is here. I think he's on the phone right now coordinating the uh, arrangements for First Lady Michelle Obama's uh, appearance at the commencement uh, at Oregon State University this year. So I think uh, that's, that's something that's very important. So uh, with that, uh, I'm going to go right into the, the, the business and uh, ask the general manager to give us his general manager's comments. Neil? Thank you, Mr. Board President. Uh, good morning to you all. Um, let me first start with a report on our fair, fair enforcement efforts and uh, just to let you know that in February we saw uh, actually 13 uh, fold increase in the number of citations over last year. The numbers were 123 last February, 1700 this February. So pretty amazing uh, change in that regard. Uh, and we continue to get very favorable comments from the public related to this program. Uh, and I, as you well know, it's amongst the issues that we'll be dealing with in the budget that gets released uh, in April. Um, and in, indeed, this is amongst the comments that we hear from the public associated with our current budget uh, shortfall. Um, it really just comes down to as simple as people wanting to know that the person sitting in the chair next to them actually has paid just like they have. And so there's a matter of fairness with it that I think is really important. So I'm very grateful for our staff in terms of the extra effort that this has is, this is entailed. But I think it's been very important to the system. I'd also note that uh, we have um, stepped up our patrols related to the system during the spring break week. Uh, sorry that none of you are enjoying it uh, in a warm climb, but at least uh, it's warm outside if it even is a little wet. Um, we are using a community policing approach where transit officers have really made a, 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 a point of becoming much more visible in terms of their uh, uh, access and, and participation in this system. The focus of their missions are to secure, to ensure safe and secure environment, sure. um, particularly some of our youth riders who sometimes get a little energetic and so we want to make sure that that energy is channeled in the right directions. Um, one of the things I'd also like to note uh, over the last month is the Shamrock Run. And again, we had an incredibly successful Sunday. If any of you were downtown during that day, it was, uh, it was well populated everywhere you went. Um, so you might say it's the luck of the Irish, I don't know, but we saw incredible growth on the system that Sunday. We actually carried, we saw a 37% increase in max ridership compared to the Sunday before. And our bus ridership of 55,000 was about was up about 8 percent from last year. So another um, sort of yeoman's job with the system serving these these big events in, in the central area, and it takes a lot of extra effort and staffing, particularly with the road closures associated with it. So again, my kudos to the operations staff for keeping everything going and carrying extra heavy loads uh, during that event. Also, just wanted to note that last night we wrapped up our public hearings related to budget proposals. Um, my thanks to all of you. You were all able to attend at, at one session or another or more, and, uh, and uh, very uh, um, well received by the people who are testifying. You will have a full report on the comments that we've gotten from all the public hearings that Dina Marshall, the uh, third party neutral, will be providing uh, to us. Um, her report is due by the end of this month and we'll be forwarding that to you directly. So even if you weren't able to be at all the hearings, you'll get the comments from really all the hearings in terms of that report. Um, we had, as you might recall, six public hearings across the region. I would say, um, that those hearings in Beaverton, Clackamas, and Gresham were pretty lightly attended. Um, even the hearing in Portland was, uh, there were 19 people testifying. Uh, the, the hearing last night uh, in North Portland was much more uh, heavily attended, and we actually had 32 uh, people attend. I think the themes, and you'll see this in the report, I, I'm, I'm sure uh, that Ms. Marshall will prepare, uh, are the fare levels, uh, free rail zone, uh, and some service issues that uh, remain of concern, although the list of service issues has reduced dramatically as we scale back the actual number and, and size and impact of the bus service reductions, so a part of that overall plan. 
Um, so I think we've also gotten some positive feedback. Uh, that has really been really the pullback related to the round trip issue uh, that you've heard. I think that many people really did appreciate that. And also the reduction in the number of changes or cutbacks related to bus service. I think that's those have been well received by the public. So we'll continue to take all the changes uh, and all the comments that we've heard on board. Um, again, we're in the midst of now pulling together the full agency budget. Beth and her staff are uh, very busy, as you'd expect, pulling together the sort of complicated document that has all the details associated with it. And we'll make all of this into a, a, a rounded proposal that we'll present to you on April 11th at your briefing there. Um, and just to remind you of the process and that your April meeting, you would consider uh, first reading of ordinances for fare and service and also approve the budget for submittal to TFCC. Budget changes can then, of course, continue to be made until its final adoption in, in June. Second reading of those um, ordinances associated with fare and service would be in May. Um, I'd also note that we've heard a lot from a coalition of riders called We All Ride the Bus, and it's led by Opal, but has other participants as well. Uh, and again, we've heard many good ideas, like charging a little extra for the, or charging a premium fare for West Service, or parking, or charging at parking rides. Those are all part of, I think, things that we have to look at in the long term. Um, Budget Task Force did look at those ideas and found that they were not very practical in the short term. Uh, but nonetheless, things that we might want to look at as we progress uh, our financial plans. Um, and there are a lot of other ideas that I think we'll be able to take on board that came from the hearings and from the comments we received from the, the public. So um, I think, again, we're going to do everything we can um, to balance this in the easiest way we can. It uh, really stretches the resources that we have available uh, best we can. Um, one key issue uh, this coalition has raised is with our fair with our fair and service proposal is our overall budget assumptions about the growth and the payroll tax, and and the other issue associated with that is the what assumption we should make about federal formula funds in the years going ahead. Um, again, federal formula funds are somewhere in the order of forty two million dollars annually. Payroll tax is over uh, two hundred and fifty million annually. Uh, 200. So I'll let Beth uh, fill you in a little bit on our current thinking about those assumptions and where we currently stand. They are critical assumptions for the budget, no question. Good morning. Um, I'm going to maybe start a little bit um, broader about the budget. Um, it's very, um, as all of you know from your businesses um, or past lives, this budget is very difficult, um, particularly in a recession and after a recession. And every budget is built on assumptions, um, many, many assumptions. Not, I'm going to focus on the two that Neil mentioned, which are the biggest, but um, many assumptions. And as Neil and I often say, we know our assumptions are going to be wrong. We just don't know which direction they're going to be wrong. Um, and our budget is particularly complex, as some of you who've been on the board know, and the rest of you will see. We have a billion-plus dollar annual budget when you include our capital programs. It will be about 300 pages reflecting the reorganization of TriMet. Behind those 300 pages are hundreds of spreadsheets, and there are thousands of lines of individual expenses that is available for the public to look at. And each line in the budget, as you see in the monthly reports, can and will have a variance by year end because we can't get everything exactly right. So. I wanted to put in perspective my comments on these two big assumptions, um, tax receipts and federal grants. But the entire, every budget is a forecasting exercise, which is by definition going to be wrong. So it's a humbling experience. Um, as I speak with, I, I'm a numbers person. I looked at a lot of numbers. I know what the past said. But it's still a humbling experience going forward because we just don't know exactly where we're going to be. So let's talk about payroll taxes, which is over half, about half of our operating budget, the most critical assumption that we make. Um, we are assuming that underlying tax revenue, which is the growth in tax revenue, not counting the annual increase in the tax, so we thought that's the measure we often look, usually look at, is going to grow at 3.5%. That's the, the projection for fiscal year 13. When you see the budget, 
um, we present it in compliance with Oregon budget law, it will show the total tax receipts, and which includes the tax increase. And that will grow at 5%. So when you look at the budget line for payroll taxes, that will be a 5% growth. So just those two numbers, everyone understands the difference. That's compared to a growth assumption of 4% underlined. So 35 for next year versus the 4% assumption we had in fiscal year 12. Um, and as board member Schweitzer might recall, that 4% assumption was uh, questioned and considered high by both members of the Finance Committee last year and by our Citizens Advisory Committee. But it turns out that um, actually this year, so far, we're receiving taxes at a rate higher than the 4% growth rate. That was until February. Um, we're actually under budget in February, and you probably saw the um, big headline last week about the big loss in Oregon jobs, jobs in the state of Oregon. It was the biggest single month loss since the middle of the recession. Wiped out all the gains, the Oregon job gains um, in the last year. Um, those numbers could be revised, but it was also reflective of, of a national trend. So. Um, the national story is that growth, we're, we're still coming out of the recession, there's still growth, but the rate of growth is slowing. Um, and there's a similar story in our three counties. Um, there's positive growth. We didn't have actual loss year over year or month to month in the counties, but it's um, the number of jobs are up um, about 1.5% since last year in the three counties. So it's a slow, positive uh, um, recovery. So what I wanted to look at then was, so the, uh, the, the assertion is that we're being overly conservative in our budgeting. Um, and I wanted to take a look at what we've done historically. So I went back from fiscal year 2001 to fiscal year 11 to see what our growth uh, assumptions have been, what the budget has been, and what the actual has been. And in aggregate, we have been overly optimistic. Um, if you add up over that 10-year that period, 11-year period, um, we had overestimated by about 45 million or 2% of total. And we've been wrong more often by overestimating. Seven out of the 11 years, we estimated our budget was higher than our actual. And the years when we were most off, not surprisingly, were the years when we were entering into or in a recession. Um, and so I have all kinds of data on that if you're interested. I won't um, make everyone listen to that. But it is, um, history is no, as, as the investment officers say, history is no guide or guarantee of the future. But our bias has been towards being overly optimistic, which is sitting in this chair and, um, as, you know, no, it's, it's logical. No one wants to um, be too conservative and make cuts. So um, the other critical factor, which doesn't show just in looking at these numbers, is what that means. So as a road, how have we we've budgeted more than we've received overall? How have we dealt with that? Um, over this last decade, our cash balances have declined. So that means that right now, our margin for error is much less than it was a decade ago. Um, again, a universal problem in the public sector. Uh, but if we're wrong now, the consequences are much more dire because we can't go to a reserve fund and, uh, and make up the difference. Um, so just to circle back, budgeting tax revenue is very difficult, not just for us. Look at the state revenue forecasts. Um, every time you get a kicker check, that means that there was a big mistake, error in revenue judgment. And the private sector is no better. Look at every quarter we hear about missing quarterly earnings estimates. It's a very inexact science. And even the Federal Reserve, which has uh, armies of economists, uh, gets it wrong. I found a quote. I just wanted to share this with you. That One of the presidents of the regional Federal Reserve said, um, at best, the economic forecasts and interest rate projections of the FOMC Federal Open Market Committee are ultimately pure guesses. I'd like to think that um, ours are more than pure guesses, but that's the Fed with probably the best economist in economic forecasting in the world. Um, so in summary, I believe, our, and our staff believe, that our revenue estimates are reasonable and realistic, but we do continually reassess them. We, I get data from the Department of Revenue who collects payroll taxes, 
on a weekly basis. Um, it's reported to you monthly. And we can and will revise the budget if we see evidence that we think the growth is going to be bigger than 3.5% underlying 5% total. But at this point, we aren't doing it. And I, I just want to emphasize, assuming a higher growth rate doesn't make our budget problems go away. It would be like assuming I'm going to have a 50% salary increase next year and spending accordingly. If I don't have uh, a bailout or savings account, it's not going to work. I'm going to have to make big cuts in it here. And that's what we really don't want to do. Um, so if there are any questions about that, I'm going to speak briefly about the federal tra tax revenues. Um, should I two other well, uh, thank you. That's a question and a comment. First, thank you for your report. I think you should repeat that for the next 10 meetings. Just exactly <laughs> what you said. We have a smaller audience today, so it might be helpful to hear it again and again. Uh, appreciate you going back over the last 10 years. That's, that's a lot of work, uh, but it's, it's good information in that. Um, what were those, what, what was the average assumption, I guess? So we're talking about 4% as our underlying. Yes. I'm just um, curious. The, well, I, the actual change, the compound, the average compound annual growth rate over that period was only 3.2%. Okay. And that compares to our 5% number now, because these are total receipts that I'm reporting on. Now, we have been in two big recessions, but that's an important number that we've been growing at 3.2 versus the 5 we're assuming now. Now, um, I, I think that's realistic. We're coming out of a recession, and growth is usually faster coming out of a recession than, you know, th those numbers average two deep recessions. But it is a number to put it in perspective. Appreciate that. Thank you. Okay. Uh, federal tax revenues. This is even harder to estimate, and um, there's really not much analysis that you can do because it's in the political process. Um, and Olivia can speak better to more detail about this than I can, but the underlying problem with the federal revenues that we get to support our operations is that it's dependent on the gas tax. Both highway and transit, the majority of the funding comes out of the highway trust fund, which is funded with the gas tax. Federal gas tax is not sufficient at its current level to support current level of transit and highway programs. And highway is 80%, transit is 20%. So underlying, there's not enough money. So. If the Congress is unwilling to fund that at a higher level and raise gas taxes, which both Congress and the administration have said they are not willing to do, then at some point, things are going to have to change. And there have been a lot of proposals on the table, um, some quite damaging to transit from the House, they didn't pass, um, some which aren't so damaging, but it's very hard to know where we should be. So the current Transportation Act expired in 2009. There have been eight extensions, and the eighth extension expires Saturday night. And there is no resolution on this. And technically, I guess, if it, if it actually expires with no extension, um, gas taxes won't be collected. And states who are building, doing highways won't be able to draw funds from the federal government. Um, I, and Olivia agrees, this is probably another example of brinksmanship, like the federal debt limit probably gets solved before midnight Saturday night, but it is Wednesday. Um, the Senate did pass out a bill which um, would not, if the House passed the Senate bill, would not require us to make the $4 million cut that we're assuming. Earlier House bills would have us make great cuts, big cuts, and if we actually were in a situation where we were only spending what we, the transit industry, were only spending the monies that were available for highway taxes. Estimates are that the cuts to operating funds would be 20 to 30 percent. So that's the range. Slightly better to 20 to 30 percent. Um, the House recently proposed a three month extension, which um, they couldn't get the votes for. So we're not really sure where we are. Some of the transit, big transit agencies on the East Coast have been down to D.C. Um, arguing that a three-month extension is terrible um, and arguing for the Senate bill, which we would like. But I don't know where that's going to come out. 
Um, so this is a big uncertainty for all transit agencies, not just for us. I've talked to my peer CFOs elsewhere, and I would say three to six months ago, they were all assuming flat uh, federal funds. Now, um, moving more towards you know, 5 to 10% cut, which is where we are for their budget. Some of them have the luxury of a January 1 budget year. So um, I have less analysis for you on that, on that front. But happy to take any questions or defer to Olivia on that. Thank you. I guess I would just make a comment. Thank you very much for your information. Um, I think in where we are right now, it, it behooves us to be somewhat conservative. I don't think overly conservative is, is appropriate either. But uh, I think the uncertainties and the way you're planning is, is very prudent. Uh, I think it's, uh, uh, it, it's a what you've been doing is good. If I look at the variance in terms of where we are year to date, both on the revenues and the expenditures, what I see is great management by uh, TriMet staff uh, anticipating the, those, those issues. And so uh, I look forward to seeing more as we get into the final budget adoption process. Hopefully we'll have some more answers in terms of where we are, especially with the federal dollars uh, that will give us some more certainty uh, before we lock and load on, on the budget for next year. But uh, uh, based on where I think we are right now and the, and the information you've given us, it feels like we're right in the right place where we need to be. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Well, there's a couple other items. Okay, please. Uh, one is I just wanted to give you an update on the Portland Mil well, Milwaukee project, of course. Um, to date, the project has created just over 1,200 jobs. Uh, we're keeping, well, there's a, actually, again, a reference to a really terrific website that we have that actually tracks those jobs and the locations of the home residents of the people who hold them. Um, so there's actually 410 construction jobs right now. Uh, and I think there's a few statistics that we're pretty proud of. 18% of those jobs are held by people of color. Um, over 6% are held by women. And again, this is a workforce that's traditionally pretty male. Uh, and nearly 16% are apprentices. So I think that, again, it's showing our programs are working in terms of getting the kind of diversity and making our workforce look like our community. That's been a priority for us uh, from the get-go. Um, bridge crews will begin construction of the East Tower in April. Uh, that's the second foundation in the, in the river. Uh, the first concrete pour for the West Pile Cap uh, is, uh, is underway and actually will also occur through next week. An enormous amount of concrete goes into that. Um, on the west segment, the column construction continues for the harbor structure uh, down to the between Lincoln and uh, South Waterfront. And we're also beginning to mobilize for construction in the Milwaukee area. So project uh, continues uh, at, at a good pace. Um, I also just wanted to note that we've had a series of health fairs at TriMet over the last uh, few weeks. Uh, and many of our employees, including this one, took advantage of them. We actually had 230 employees have a confidential health screening, which included uh, looking at glucose and tolerance and our, our, uh, cholesterol and BMI and uh, counseling related to health uh, wellness. Um, we also had a number of, of vendors from each, both of our, uh, from many of our health um, uh, affiliates in terms of insurance providers and others. Um, and so employees had a chance to interact with, uh, with those experts provided by those firms. Uh, I'd say it was a success. It's something that we need to continue and sort of make a regular drumbeat of our, of our business world here at TriMet. Uh, but I think we'll continue to look for other opportunities to do that. One of those opportunities is the um, American Heart Association Heart Walk in May. And we've been promoting this internally. And um, by the way, if you're free on a particular day, I have a team that still has vacancies. Uh, there's a lot of comp friendly competition within TriMet right now on this then. And we're trying to keep the track talk to a minimum, but you know, nonetheless, the general manager's team will do well, I'm sure. Um, I also wanted another little special report this morning. Um, we have an uh, anniversary here of one of our key safety initiatives, which is our request for safety assessment. That was one of the key programs to bring information from our frontline employees to our safety staff to get high level attention and resolution in a real time manner. So I wanted Harry Supporta to put uh, this in perspective for you, give you a little report on this program at its one year anniversary. Good morning. Good morning. As Neil said, um, this marks the first anniversary of our request for safety assessment program. 
and I wanted to give you uh, an update on that um, because it is one of our more important programs and it is a key component of soliciting feedback from our workforce. But I think we need to um, step back a little bit and give you some background information. In 2010, uh, TriMet initiated a top to bottom uh, review of our safety program and we hired a consultant to help us in that effort. Um, at the same time, Neil put together a task force on safety and uh, service excellence. Um, that task force made 19 separate recommendations which then resulted in over 249 separate tasks that we were uh, uh, that we had to uh, complete, and uh, more importantly, these programs had to be sustained. And the recommendations were aimed at making safety a value, not just a top priority, because priorities change. We want something that was sustainable. And more importantly, it was also aimed at empowering the workforce and providing feedback what were the issues and what was important to them. So, obviously, we looked at the frontline workforce. Um, they are the ones that are out there with the eyes to identify safety problems. And actually, there was a feedback mechanism in the past, and it was called the um, Operator's Condition Report, or it was more uh, commonly referred to as the yellow card program because it was a yellow report and that was what was submitted. But unfortunately what happened was that it was a very cumbersome process. Um, the yellow cards were difficult to track, uh, audit, and we weren't really to, able to report progress on what was really being achieved. And unfortunately a lot of these safety issues were left unaddressed. So we looked very hard at this particular program and we found that the issues were not being prioritized and we were not tracking them to closure. And we were not highlighting the safety issues. They were getting lost in the shuffle. So what we did was we created a separate program. That's the Request for Safety Assessment. And initially this was available to only the bus transportation program bus transportation division because we wanted to pilot the process. Was this really the, the direction that we wanted to go? So with that, we put together a small task force made principally of uh, operations personnel and safety personnel, and they created a process in which operators were able to provide feedback online, something that was easy to do, and also on, on paper if that was necessary. Um, eventually, this all migrated to an online process. So, when a safety issue was identified, the safety staff would then route it to the appropriate department for review and resolution. And what was also important as part of this process was the operator was given immediate feedback. They were informed that, yes, we did receive the information, and yes, we were working on it. And some of these issues took quite a bit of time to resolve, so we would also provide periodic feedback as needed. Once the department re identified a resolution to the issue, the process didn't stop there. We then, it went back to the safety staff and they evaluated the resolution as well. Did it really fix the problem? Did it really address the problem? And there were times that it didn't, or there were times that staff would say, it was good enough, as it was. And safety staff would say, no, it's not good enough. Try again. So we would go back and there would be a lot of uh, back and forth and um, uh, we would eventually reach a, an agreement as to the direction. So over time, I think the operators became much more confident and we started to see an increase in the number of RSAs that were submitted to um, the safety staff and the operations division. And then, so with that in mind, that we want to eventually increase this last July, it was opened up to all employees. So at the end of 2011, we found that we received over 220 requests for safety assessments. 220. That's quite a number. And at its peak, we were receiving as many as 10 a week. So on average, that would be about, about four to five a week. 
Um, what I think is also important to note is that of the 220 that we received, we were actually able to close 190 of them. So that was a pretty remarkable achievement. <coughs> What's not surprising is that about three-fifths of these all came from the bus operators, because that's where the majority of our service is from. But what was also surprising, but what was surprising was we received a number of operational concerns from non-operating personnel. So they were actually out there observing problems and reporting them as well. So if we also analyze the types of problems, uh, about 30% were related to bus stops themselves, about 30% were related to the street operating environment, and then the rest were equipment, traffic, and other concerns. It was a, kind of a mishmash of things. Um, but at the same time, some of these issues were not just TriMet issues. They were issues that involved our jurisdictional partners as well. And so many of these involved ODOT as well as PDOT. Um, and that still remains a challenge in trying to coordinate that effort. So um, what I wanted to do is highlight a couple of specific instances. One was at Northeast Sandy in Prescott. Uh, an operator was concerned that after making a left turn that he would have to service a stop, and that there wasn't enough room to make lane change to do it safely. So um, there was a team of us that went out to look at the stop, including myself, and we found not only was there a problem with that stop, but we also found that there was a potential for a head-on collision. And so we then uh, reached out to PDOT, told them what the issues were, and I'm happy to report that that turn is now being addressed, if not already, and, um, and the stop obviously was moved as well. So I, that was a, a good resolution. In another case, we had a, a number of close calls at our Foster Road rail crossing. Um, so a team of us went out and looked at that as well. Uh, that's along the ODOT bike path, which meant that whatever control we put in place would also have to, we'd have to have concurrence from ODOT. That took quite a while to resolve. That took over six months because of the back and forth and, and coordinating the different types of designs that might be uh, achieved there. Um, but that too was resolved and the additional safety controls were put in place. So that's another success story. And then we have a number of other issues that aren't as dramatic as those, but nevertheless important to the workforce that submitted the requests. So that's just a brief overview of where we are today. Uh, we continue to make refinements to the program. Um, we're trying to make it much more efficient. We still get bogged down. We're trying to close the gap in the number of days that it takes to resolve some of these. Uh, initially, it started out at about 40 days, and now we're somewhere around 20 days like to close that gap even further. But remember, we also have these the jurisdic jurisdictional partners to work with as well. So um, as part of this process, we're beginning to also involve the safety committees. We want them to be part of the RSA process because employee feedback is really what's at the crux of this and it's very important. So with that, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Question uh, more a comment. Uh, first, thank you for your report. We have been talking about this for quite some time, and it's kind of gotten lost in the shuffle with all of our other many issues. Um, I appreciate your honesty. That's uh, it's refreshing to hear that we had a lot to work on as well. I wish some of uh, the people were here that have spoken about safety over the years. Um, and hopefully they'll they'll get that feedback as well. So just appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Board President, one more item. I did want to just take a moment to uh, respond to the Oregonian article that appeared over the weekend that I thought was, uh, frankly, uh, an inaccurate characterization of uh, how we manage our human resources. Um, so as you know, over the past year, I've discussed with you um, 
particularly related to our budget, uh, about some of the tough decisions we need to make to reorganize staff, to streamline staff, to reduce levels and layers of management uh, so that we had more funds available um, to actually apply to service into the front line. Um, so th this, the article tended to gloss over a few things. One is that you should know we are continuing to re reduce administrative staff. That's sort of fundamental. Uh, we have increased our latest budget proposal, which is under review right now, our target for internal efficiencies from 500,000 to 1.2 million. So we've increased that. Uh, our new budget will be down six to seven administrative positions. Um, and so um, we will continue to shrink the administration, and that has been the case really over the last number of years, as you well know. Um, but in that, there is a realignment that's necessary when we begin to make some changes. Uh, and, and I think that those are important realignments and important for our business. And again, critical business needs such as human resources and accounting deserve um, uh, attention to make sure that we're meeting those critical business needs. Um, the article mentioned two positions that we cut. One was related to safety and one was related to customer service. I just wanted to cut, or set the record straight on those. The safety position is being redefined into a much more important for a safety analyst position that can begin to work on the issues uh, such as Harry brought before you. Um, so it is not being lost. We are simply changing the emphasis of the business and looking for different skills and talents that we think are more important to actually making uh, headway on our safety initiatives overall. And then second of all is there was a director position related to customer service. Um, and uh, that, as we have consolidated our marketing and our customer service functions, was a duplicate director position. Uh, so Drew Blevins will continue to be our overall um, uh, uh, director for customer services. Indeed, that department will be renamed, and I'm not sure of the exact rename, but we're losing the marketing and moving on to really customer uh, information and services as the emphasis of that department, and Drew Blevins will lead that. So again, we're trying to, uh, reduce uh, extraneous levels of management as we uh, continue to try to put the resources to the um, to the front line. Um, and I, the other thing that I would note, and um, you probably know this very well, is that uh, as we develop and post positions, there is a salary range associated with them. Trying to human resources uh, model has a very wide salary range uh, as its na as, as sort of its nature. Um, the reporter just listed the very top of the range. We very rarely, um, almost never, I would say, hire uh, anywhere near the top of the range, usually to the second bottom of the, of the range, usually where positions start. So I think that was a misrepresentation as well that I thought you should know about. Um, I, I would continue to tell you that I think the Trident administration staff is extremely talented, extremely hardworking. They're doing more with less um, and more with less every year. Uh, and so this is a, a continuing drain, I think, and uh, needs a continuing reassessment. So as hard as everybody does work and as great a job as everybody does do, I think that we need and we owe a continued reassessment of our administrative staff, our alignment to keep business needs and functions, and that's what I'm committed to do. Um, so despite some criticism, and despite the fact that sometimes these are hard decisions because we have to make trades associated with personnel and skills and talents, and those never come easy, I think it's the right thing to do. Uh, and I wanted to report to you on that and see if you had any questions for me on that. That, do, that does conclude my remarks section, though, unless there are questions, Mr. Board President. Are there any other questions from the board? Thank you so much, you appreciate it. It's always great to hear about our financial uh, status as well as what we're doing in safety. So again, appreciate the thorough update this morning. Um, so let's move on. The Finance and Audit Committee met two weeks ago. I believe uh, Director Schweitzer has a report for us uh, this morning. Did we? More finance. <laughs> Yes, we met uh, March 14th, and we talked about three issues, mostly uh, labor issues, of course. That's a, that's a big one for us. Um, it's expected that TriMet and the ATU will be in arbitration the week of May 14th through the 17th. So since the decision is expected to be too late for our budget, that will not be incorporated in the, uh, the year 13 budget. 
Um, with respect to the budget process, thank you. We've already heard a great report from Beth. Um, I'll just read here. Um, it's based on the assumption, and again, Beth talked a lot about assumptions this morning, that we win, that TriMet wins the arbitration. This results in the need to fill a $12 million shortfall rather than the $17 million shortfall. And some of you heard that at our, our recent hearings, why we're estimating the 12. Um, if TriMet loses the arbitration, it will be early in the fiscal year and there will be time to make the additional $5 million of cuts or budget corrections in fiscal year 13. Um, staff will continue, as Beth said this morning, to review all the underlying growth assumptions in the draft budget and be prepared to update uh, if we can do that. Uh, and lastly, we talked about office space. Uh, the committee was briefed on some uh, changes to the, the Central Street facility resulting in, as a result of the Milwaukee project. Um, the project will eliminate some of the office space on 17th and remodel the current Center Street building into an operations control center. Uh, most of this will be covered by a federal grant. So we'll continue to hear about that in our upcoming meetings. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any board members have questions? So, Director Swetson. Okay. Thank you, Tiffany. Very much appreciate that. Uh, the last report we have this morning uh, is from the Committee on Accessible Transportation, or CAT as we call it. Uh, Dr. Bethel, do you have a report for us this morning? Thank you. Good morning to everyone. Just a few additional comments beyond what you've received. There was discussion about the budget choices as well as uh, some discussion around the mandatory securement of the fixed route. Uh, some feeling that there should be something, some feeling that there need not be. Uh, of course, some personal stories about individuals dealing with how they're being asked to, whether you want to be, and I use this word, quote unquote, do you want to be tied down? And um, that's not a good way of asking a person with a disability, do you want to be secured um, as you're riding? I have, as I've ridden the bus, have uh, observed some times where individuals have gotten on and said they do not want to be secured, and yet I watch them themselves holding on, so I do have some concern about what is the best way to secure a person with a mobility device once they are, are riding the bus particularly. So that's one issue. Um, the boundary changes, the discussion about that, I think again, um, as Director Schweitzer said about the financial piece needing to be repeated and repeated again, I do believe that this around the boundaries and particularly the issue that once it's within inside of the larger catchment area, we do have these things that are referred to as donut holes, um, where they just overlap. But in the catchment, it doesn't make a difference. And yet there were some that I felt that were not grasping that even though technically you don't have it, but because you're in the larger catchment, you do have it. So that needs to be done again. So I'm looking at the, my fellow director's faces, they're saying, yeah, we're about as puzzled as they are. But uh, <laughs> you understand donuts. <laughs> So that's just a, just a little hole of service in terms of where the boundaries would extend from where a route is running at a particular day with that catchment area. One thing that was mentioned by Michael Levine and that, that um, you know, just raised my eyebrows a little bit because of, um, he mentioned, and of course, you know, Mr. Levine talks a lot to us about the ADA. But he makes a reference, and I apologize to the staff, I'm not asking you to respond now, but do want to put this on the table of the record, to ask you to do some, some looking and get back, um, but preferably before the next CAT meeting to take some of this information back. Um, as his request is, or his implications, or is that the Civil Rights Bill has much to do with um, what happens with ADA. And uh, maybe we can look at that, give us some instances of what that is, so that it won't just be a reference lobbed out there. There will be something that either substantiates or does not substantiate what it's being referred to. That concludes the report. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Bethel. Questions of uh, Dr. Bethel? 
Thank you. Yes. So, a question about donuts. Um, <laughs> is, is the, the issue you're referring to for is related to uh, weekend service? Uh, or are you talking about service areas where we have gaps, uh, the boundaries of TriMet, such as uh, Boring, Damascus, uh, Wilsonville, uh, which are outside of our service territory, versus um, the change, uh, perspective change in policy related to when bus service changes occur with our new budget, that that would also reflect on uh, the provision of service as provided list, lift customers. Which is it? The latter. So if, if we can organize ourselves in terms of being able to effectively, and I'm not suggesting you were not effective in that, it was just maybe my level of understanding, so that we're able to address uh, in, in real clear ways uh, as we move forward with, with budget changes. I think those were some of the concerns I've heard most frequently at the budget committee meetings that we all had the opportunity to attend. Uh, so as we ex express those changes to both the general public and the Lyft community, ADA and elderly, I think we're going to have to be very, very uh, clear. Uh, what well, we have to do, I think probably the appropriate time for that would be, um, again, I think at your next briefing we can include that. And again, I, again, I think that there is a lot of special outreach that's going to be required um, related to these topics because donuts and donut holes get a little complicated over time. But yeah. Any other questions? Great. Thank you, Dr. Bethel. So um, before we move into the regular business today, uh, I wanted to take a couple moments to say thank you to someone who every day is a, is a positive face of, of customer service for uh -oh. a TriMet. And the person we want to talk about, and, uh, and uh, uh, I'm actually honored today, is Ed Rosney, who is uh, TriMet's manager of on-street customer service. And I'm going to ask Ed to come up, and I'd like to actually to ask, if you don't mind, the board to, to all of us, let's step up front here when Ed comes up, and we've got a couple things we'd like to present to him, and I know there's some reporters here that'd like to get a picture of this, I think, so. somebody who was uh, profiled in a, a recent article in the Oregonian about the customer service he provides every day, not every day, uh, for, for the Blazer games, getting folks to and from uh, Max in, in, a, in a very orderly way, gets them on the service, and does it with a smile. Uh, after reading that article, the board and I uh, decided that we really wanted to take a moment to honor you, uh, and uh, the reporter actually suggested that we should purchase some tickets for you to a Blazer game. Uh, and uh, the board and, and uh, I con concurred in that. So what, first off, what I'd like you to know is that the board with the, with the Trailblazers want to honor you for the 300 games that you, you service the public and helping them get, get, the, get the max and on other transit uh, in an effective way. And I know that you've not been able to see one second of any of those games <laughs> because of the, of the time you spent. So first off, we have some tickets that were donated by the Trailblazers for, for next Monday's game. So, so thank you for that. Thank you. I guess I could hold this up for everybody could hear me. The other thing is we wanted to also give you a plaque, which is a plaque which uh, recognizes they get the efforts, but really just provides a good copy of the article and the picture of you that was in the paper. So we want you to have that too. Thank you. Very much. Thank you. Well, thank you. Well, I, I do want to say, I would just like to, yes, I'm used to having the microphone after the I, 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 I would uh, uh, like to thank you very much for a generous, I think Joe Rose did a very generous article, which uh, was very, very uh, gratifying, had lots of customers come up to us about it. But I do want to point out, yeah, I'm, I'm maybe the public face of that effort, but we have a lot of uh, operations staff the uh, sort of very unsung heroes of so Brad Hansen, great rail supervisor, Andrew Garcia, bus supervisor. Uh, they're out there night after night, year after year. 
Uh, so really, they, they deserve this. I'll try to sneak them in on this ticket. Uh, Good luck on that one. Yes. Uh, but then also, it's important to mention too, we have, uh, part of the reason we work so hard on these, uh, there's a number of customers we've seen year in, year out, uh, even all the ups and downs of the Blazers through the years. And they continue to ride us, they continue to go to the games, and that's also very motivating and uh, makes us feel really good about what we do and what, what TriMet does to help them. Great. Thank you. Thanks again. Agenda. The first order of business is the uh, consent agenda, and this is uh, the consent agenda is those area uh, items that we think are routine. In fact, this uh, this meeting we only have the uh, minutes from the last meeting. So, uh, is there a motion to approve the consent agenda? So moved. Moved. Second. Second. Okay. Um, is there any discussion? Okay. Uh, there's not. So, uh, all those in favor of the motion, say aye. 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 All those opposed? No. Uh, the motion carries unanimously. Thank you very much. So moving on then to the first resolution, uh, which is resolution 12-03-2026, which authorizing submission of one grant application to the Federal Transit Administration for fiscal year 12 state surface transportation program capital assistance and entering into an agreement, intergovernmental grant agreement with the Oregon Department of Transportation to exchange funds. Mr. General Manager, that was staff report on this. Yes, very short, very brief, uh, Mr. Board President. Uh, this is, um, and many of you who have been on the board have seen these uh, agreements before, but it's an agreement with the state of Oregon to actually receive uh, state transportation or uh, service transportation funds, STP funds. We will apply those funds to our preventive maintenance program, which is an eligible use for those funds. Uh, and in exchange, we will provide TriMet General Fund to the state so that they have funds that they can use in this case to provide um, the operation support for the Amtrak Cascade service, which otherwise the federal capital related funds would not be eligible for. This is an example of the kind of um, I think intergovernmental relations that we've had and I think good uh, stewardship of, of, of public funds that we've had over a long period of time with the state of Oregon. Uh, it does point out that there is a long-term issue, uh, which the state is very clear about, about how to fund the Amtrak Cascade service over a long period of time. But this does uh, allow the service to continue uh, through the next fiscal year. So with that, I recommend approval. Again, no impact on the TriMet General Fund. This says, and if the agreements are set up in such a way to really protect the TriMet General Fund uh, and allow us to draw the grant funds and apply them to our preventive maintenance program and then re re return the general funds that we would otherwise have spent on those programs uh, to the state. So with that, I recommend approval. Any questions from uh, the directors? Okay. With that, I'd entertain a motion to approve the resolution. A motion to approve. We have a, a motion and a second. All those in favor, signify saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion. No, the motion uh, does uh, carry uh, unanimously. Moving on to the second set of resolutions, there's three of them, and that's resolution 12-03-27, resolution 12-03-28, and resolution 12-03-29 all of which are authorizing TriMet to acquire by purchase or by uh, exercise of power of eminent domain certain real properties necessary to construct but to the to the construction of the Portland Milwaukee Light Rail project. Yeah, Mr. General Manager. Yeah, Mr. Board President, members of the board, uh, this res these resolutions, and I'll address my comments all three at once, uh, are related to condemnation actions required for each of these properties. The staff reports notes and the maps notes the actual parcels involved and the juxtaposition of project facilities and why they're necessary for the project. 
I might note that each of these parcels was included in your earlier resolution that identified the property required and authorized us to make offers on property. In each of these cases, there has been an appraisal, a review appraisal, and an offer made to the property owner. And in each of these cases, we've been unable at this stage uh, to uh, resolve with the individual property owner the price. And uh, so again, the combination is a procedure that allows us to advance those conversations. Um, we can deposit funds in court uh, for the access of the property owner. Um, and so there are some advantages to moving ahead with a condemnation procedure, primarily related to project schedule. Again, what we try to do is back these up, give as much time for negotiations as we possibly can, and come to you at sort of the critical time when we really need the access to the property for the benefit of the project. Uh, and our commitment to you continues to be that we will continue to work uh, uh, to uh, and, and work and negotiate with property owners to come to our willing buy a willing seller arrangement on these. And in most of, nearly all of the cases, we are successful in achieving that. Um, and this is just part of that process is getting us there. So with that, I would recommend approval of these three resolutions. And certainly, uh, me or other staff are here available for questions. Questions to the general manager? Yes. Please, Dr. Bell. Uh, Bill. Someone can help me with the maps, particularly on the one for 12 3 29. I'm a little bit confused because when I look at the acquisition sketch, as opposed to the next one in our package that's titled 3593 Fisher, the streets, I'm having a problem putting them together. The acquisition shows me Wren Street, Burke Street, um, the other map shows me Sparrow Street and River Road. I will ask uh, Mr. Blocker or Mr. Stepmother to respond to that. <laughs> Figure out where the other two roads so I know where the parcel sits. Yeah. I know the maps are of slightly different scales, and I think that's part of the problem that we have here. Good morning. And, uh, I have uh, Jillian Detweiler here, our Director of Real Property, and I'm going to ask Jillian if she can reconcile for you between these two maps. Okay. Let's see. I, I'm not... I, I mean, I can tell you that these are... This property, the Fisher property, is adjacent to McLaughlin Boulevard. Um, I'm, I'm also having trouble with the acquisition sketch. Um, I think the best representation of the acquisition is the one that shows the project improvements. Um, so this second map, um, because I know that this property is a single family home that backs onto the trolley trail and then onto McLaughlin. And the light rail line will impact the back of that property and thus the home. So in relations to, and having that out in relations to that feather, the spot back. So just throw away the acquisition map. Let me ask this question. Does Wren Street and Burke Street intersect at some point on Southeast River Road? You know, I'm not certain. Rob, that's a, do you want to explain it? Okay. No, I can't. <laughs> 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 yeah, that's right. I should have took it out and turned it. I just want to get it right. I don't, I don't, you know, I, I'm sorry. I know where it is. I, the street name. Rob Bernard, project director. Uh, it's confusing because you have to kind of peel them apart yes. and spin them in order to get them together. But essentially the line McLaughlin is here, represented by McLaughlin there. You see the right little run, light rail line running next to it. You can see that this partial acquisition is this area right in here. So you have to kind of peel it apart in order to kind of make sense because it rotated on the page from one another. So it, I think the other way to say it is on the top of the top map there, 
it, there's a road that un, on this top map, there's an unnamed road that comes up from River Road to the parcel. And yeah, is this one here? It looks like that might be Rand Street. Yeah, so this this would be is it and River, River Road would be here, right? On that map. And Rand Street would be here, which is unnamed on this map. Yeah. Okay. And then Burke Street would be the next one. Would be the next one there. Yes. And I think Dr. Beth Bethel brings up a very good point. I know these come up off of CIS maps That's and correct. stuff, but it would be helpful, like in this type of situation, when the key steep street names don't appear on the larger map, if there's some way to do it, sort of because I think it's absolutely right. That's good. Thank you. Did I ask your question? Yes. Any other questions? All right. Uh, I will point out that we have one person who uh, wanted to provide testimony on uh, item number 29, the last resolution, Laurel Smith. Please come up. You have three minutes, please, to uh, give testimony. Well, I, I'm a board member at the Genealogical Forum of Oregon, and we are an organization that has been somewhat recently displaced. <laughs> and. Uh, I cannot express in words the impending doom that we felt when we when we were told that our building was going to be torn down and we had to move. But TriMet came in and uh, helped us through every step of the process. Um, we have a, a large ref research library with over 32,000 books and all of the things that go with it. Uh, we are a nonprofit organization. Our money comes from donations and membership fees that are charged. So money was a huge issue for us. But TriMet came in right from the very beginning, and they supported the move um, well, emotionally. <laughs> and uh, they uh, helped us. They provided a real estate person to help us research and look for new properties to occupy. They, uh, they were there with us every step of the way until we moved to a new location. Our old location was at the end of a dead-end street where we didn't have good visibility, but it worked. And with our money that we have, we could not have moved from there if we did not have TriMet support. But they, as I said, TriMet came in. They helped us find a new location. They helped us with the move itself. They helped us to adapt the new location for our needs. Um, as a research library with these books, we had to have uh, very specific uh, humidity controls and temperature controls and so on. Uh, they helped us to advertise our move. They helped us to uh, uh, basically through every step of the process. And our old location was, was not ideal, but we would still be there if we had not been fit, forced to move. Uh, and then being moved, we are now in an absolutely fabulous location. Uh, much better visibility, much better traffic, and it has turned out to be just the most positive, rewarding, wonderful experience. And we could not have done it without TriMet's help. So I just want to speak to the fact that um, that we were, as I said, we had this sense of doom, but TriMet was there with us to basically hold our hand every step of the way and help us get relocated, resituated, and open for business and to make the public aware of it. And I just wanted everyone to be aware of that. Are there any questions? Questions. Yes. Okay. Which property is this? Uh, Horton, Blake, I think you said the last one, Fisher. Oh no, this this our property was over on Gideon. Okay. Along the rail tracks, okay. and so and the building was scheduled to be torn down, and we have moved. We, as I said, it, it occurred last summer. Okay. And it has turned out to be just a very very positive experience, and and I just wanted to express that. Okay. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Directors, Mark, did you have a question? A comment. More of a comment, and this is not from a person involved in communications, but for, for years, uh, Oregon uh, saddled itself with the title of process called condemnation. It's a, it's a rather fearsome word. Uh, what we just heard describes an opportunity, though, where through working together, we can actually, in some cases, as you do, make things better for individuals, businesses, community organizations. In some cases, that doesn't work out. I mean, it's 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 a difficult process. Relocation is one of those five things you don't want to go through in life. Um, but if we could work to provide on our website or on mutual websites like this links 
that, that help to tell folks uh, publicly how we can uh, assist the community in accommodating change like this. Uh, and in some cases, we can't. But, but I think what that does is help, like what has occurred in North Portland or in Gresham or in Hillsboro, in Beaverton, uh, in Clackamas, in downtown Portland, a process where TriMet is part of a community building, and it just so happens in this case it occurs through that unfortunate word, condemnation. Uh, but, I, but I think there's an opportunity for us. And in some cases, we won't be able to satisfy individual needs. Um, as to the extent that an individual or a business or a nonprofit might like, but we can actually do tell the story that that one word condemnation doesn't allow us to. We will follow up. Thank you, Director Clark. Any other comments? So, just for me, clarification here, uh, Mr. Ann, we can do one motion for all three of the resolutions? We can. Okay. So I would like to then entertain a ask for a motion to approve the resolutions. One motion. So moved. Moved. Second. Second. We have a, a motion and a second. Any other further comments on this? Okay. Uh, all those in favor, say aye. 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 All those opposed? Hearing none. The motion uh, or, excuse me, the motion carries. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Um, so with that, um, our business agenda is complete, and uh, I'm going to officially adjourn the meeting. Uh, there will be no further consideration of business items before the board this morning, uh, but uh, we want to open the, 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 the testimony for, for public forum. Uh, and I want to remind the audience that's here today that TriMet Board of Directors is not required to hold a public forum, but we do so as a courtesy. Uh, we will take as many commenters uh, as we can uh, th this morning. Um, and uh, we were hoping that everyone can limit their time to uh, three minutes. Uh, I'd also point out we don't uh, allow you to donate your time to uh, uh, one, of the, uh, one of the speakers that are here. So uh, once you uh, begin your testimony, we're going to begin timing, and when the, the timer goes off, I'm going to ask you to uh, quickly wrap up your testimony. But we do want to hear from you. And again, I'll say this at the end, if you have information uh, that you, you want to provide that's longer than three minutes, I'd encourage you, if you have it in writing, to, to give it to our uh, board uh, secretary here. Uh, raise your hand, and, we'll, and they'll make sure that, uh, that all of us get that information. So with that, I have a list of folks that have signed up this morning. The, uh, the first is uh, Gordon Merced. Gordon, and then I have, after Gordon Merced, well, I have to come up to Keith Schultz. See Keith? Okay, great. Mr. Merced, please. Well, thank you, good morning, and thank you for your time. I'm here to offer my uh, sincere thanks for the energy and 